So you play on the ego of the wall, the whole wall, the whole donor thing, it's all very ego driven. So you get the right people, right? And you may not be able to pay $25 million in an endowment to get your name on the side of a building in, in a hospital. Um, but you can jockey for position to get, you know, on the top of the legacy wall. Welcome back to another episode of Lights, Camera, Crypto, the podcast exploring all things entertainment and Web3. I'm your host, Stephen Ladden, and this week's guest is Adrian Ashley. Adrian is an NFT architect and is an award-winning filmmaker. And both of those things we discuss in this week's episode uh, as integral beacons on her path to being in the Web3 space and working on projects that give back to communities. She has a very, very interesting story as a woman of many hats and is in some circles known as the number one woman in blockchain. So fascinating story, fascinating path. Let's dive in. Adrian, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I'm yeah, looking forward pleasure. to it. Same, same. Thanks so much for, for joining on. Um, I mean, you have such a, a a rich career in a lot of different things, uh, you know, many of which we'll we'll get into. But just to start, you know, growing up, what what did you envision doing? Because I can't imagine. I mean, NFTs and being an NFT architect wasn't something that was perhaps in the in the ether at that point. So, what were your initial aspirations uh, when it came to a vocation? Uh, when I was a tiny, tiny human, uh, I was a dancer. Okay. I was actually a dancer for a number of years. I was in a professional dance company when I was 14 years old. So dancer, uh, entrepreneur. I started becoming an entrepreneur when I was seven. I grew up on welfare wow. in one of the richest counties in the country. And so I didn't like not having money. So in order to get some, I went to the fabric store with my mom and I would go to the scrap bin and I would just buy all these little scraps of fabric and I would turn them into those decorated headbands. You're too young to remember the movie Perfect with Jamie Lee Curtis, but they had these decorated headbands because aerobics was all the thing. Sure. And I would sell them to the dance shop for $7. They'd turn around and sell them for 20. Uh, and that's how I made money when I was seven years old till I was about 15, 16, uh, at 16. Teen, actually, no. Yeah, at 16, uh, I started working at Relax in Fairfax, which is a hot tub place. So I was surrounded by naked people and having to learn all the different <laughs> types of massages um, uh, so that I could book them. I was the receptionist person who checked people in. So I was surrounded by naked people, which I didn't even bat an eyelash because I grew up working at the Renaissance Fair from the time I was seven until I was uh, 17, so 10 years. 18, really. But see, under 18, you could get away with a lot. You could go around with your girlfriends holding hands, hog tying guys and making them kiss you. When you turn 18, <laughs> you're legal. Things change. Things yeah. change. You don't get right. to get away. You have to own your actions at that point. You're given a pass before that. So I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, right. It's it's kind of like you have 18 years to figure it out. And then after that, they're like, yeah. you should know. <laughs> you should know. You should know by right. now. Yeah. Well, so, how, yeah. Well, how, how, yeah, yeah, please, no, <laughs> please continue. Because this is already just what a fascinating start to, you know, you mentioned the entrepreneurship and, and yep. uh, the, you, uh, the very it sounds like it, it came from a desire. You said you, you grew up in a very wealthy community and, and, and wanting I did. to. Yeah. Have... Everybody got Mercedes, Porsche, Jaguars, you know, those kinds of things. When they turned 16, I didn't get a car when I was, when I was four, 14, my mom said she'd buy me a car. When I was 15, she said she'd help me buy a car. And when I was 16, she said, I want you to buy it yourself so that you'll appreciate it more. And at this point mm -hmm. I was like, uh oh, I got my my driver's license the day of my 16th birthday. And I was just like free spirit after that. But um, yeah, that's why I went and got a job at Relax and started cutting class so I could work more so I could buy a car. So priorities, right? Making sure. money was a major priority. And uh, I ended up dropping out of high school and going to college full time because I'd already started going to college when I was 14. And wow. so I just said, see ya. Uh, I had tried out for cheerleading and nobody bothered to tell me. Song leading is what it's called, the pom-pom girls. Uh, it was like the biggest deal 
Like you, your whole high school career built to this. And I got all points possible. They didn't tell me that I didn't qualify because I'd been cutting class to go work to make money, uh, that I didn't qualify with the GPA in order to make the team. And so they told me a month of rehearsals, a month of practice every day at lunch, nobody said a word until the day before tryouts. I could have pulled my grade up like without even trying, but nobody said anything. So when I couldn't be a song leader for my senior year, I said, nope. So I went full time to college and started a cheerleading program there. That's still there to this day. Wow. Which is entrepreneurship on a whole nother level. So <laughs> it sounds like the the sort of backbone to your decisions and an early life were fueled by the desire to, you know, earn a living, desire to support yourself and also well it sounds dance and cheer, but but really the the desire to kind of carve your own your own path. I I don't like boxes. I've burned mine long ago. And one of the biggest things that a pattern that has reoccurred in my life is I'm a very solution oriented person. What do I want? How do I get it? What is a problem I see? How do I fix it? Um, at 20, I was a computer expert. Uh, I won't even go into the time that I moved down to Los Angeles and for a year and it was, <laughs> that's a whole nother hour right there. But when I moved <laughs> back, um, I was an expert at computers and computers were just starting. And so I became an organizational management consultant right about that same time the recession was hitting. So businesses were losing a lot of money. So I came up with a framework for small business where we would move a lot of their administrative tasks to the computer. So it would take way less time, like 90% less time. And then that would free up the support staff to support the salespeople to take off everything that they had to do other than sell. And so everybody that I worked with either stayed the same, stayed flat, didn't have to lay anybody off or actually increased. And then the city of San Rafael was one of my biggest clients at the time. And I, I mean, I, they were my first big client. I gave them free phone calls for life, man, 10 years later, she's still calling me go, how do I get to this file again? <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy business, but you know, I've always been good at seeing solutions, how to do things better. Um, you know, what's the fastest path to done and success and also looking at things, you know, in a forensic way, like where, where are we dropping the ball? Where are we missing this? Where are leads falling off? Like all of those kinds of things. So I, I literally went into internet marketing back when girls weren't allowed. So my name mm. was David and I sold woodshed kits for the backyard and a lot of the big Titans in the internet. Uh, I've known them for 25 plus years. Uh, they've known me for 20 and they're now starting to figure it out. Cause I, I asked one of them, I'm like, Hey, you remember David? He's like, yeah, whatever happened to him? I'm like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you had an alias. I had an alias. Uh, yeah, I had an alias before nom de plumes and aliases and anonymous, uh, aliases were a thing. And it was strictly because girls weren't allowed in the boys club, wow. which is funny because girls aren't allowed in the boys club in Hollywood either. I'm also an award-winning film producer. And since I was 20, early 20s, I've been the only girl in the cigar room with a bunch of pretty big titans. I'm not a girl to them. I'm an asset class for my ideas. So they've never looked at me like a girl. So I'm either not a girl or if girls aren't allowed and they really like are stringent about that, then I have to pretend to be a boy or I had to. Now pretty much nobody looks at me like I'm a girl. I, I don't, they don't even think of it. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I'm just there's so much here to 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 <laughs> to, to, to to dive into, uh, and and I hear you on the. It sounds like there's in terms of classification, we're we're talking about uh, you know having to kind of infiltrate what you were saying was traditionally or in some ways still is uh, a boys' club of of yes. industry and. I mean, well, f first of all, let's just start there. That that to 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 w was it an email address that that you had that just said David, and that was yeah, you know, or or and, and oh no, and so no, 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 I went so much farther than that. I had a photo um, way back when in the '90s. There was a website where you could literally create a fictional person, and it had your name, your address, your social security number, your job title, your age, like every everything, a whole dossier, like with one click. Wow. So, it, so David oh, yeah. was a, 
was a living profile, basically. Yes, David. David was a whole a whole thing. Um, but back then, we we didn't have voice, right? Everything sure. was just text and forums, so you know nobody could tell. Uh, so that wow. so that worked. But I had been working on computers. I started programming computers when I was twelve. You know, I used my first computer when I was five. So I had one of the first email accounts at the well in Sausalito, one of the first public ones. So, you know, I've been in it for a really, really, really long time. I just look fabulous. <laughs> that you do. Um, so then, then it sounds like computers and technology, aside from, mm -hmm. well, in addition to being an entrepreneur and, and figuring out how to make a living and, and, and from a very young age too, you, you said, you're, you know, being seven and selling the headbands Yeah, was, was crypto and cryptocurrency in the world and web three, that world, it, I guess, what, how, how did you take your, your infrastructure, uh, as a professional, which again, seems primed to go into the future of the internet. How did that all come together and how did you follow that, uh, particular path? Okay. So. I was an influencer on MySpace and then Facebook started and my girlfriend was dating the number three at Facebook. And so she pulled me over to Facebook um, and I started on Facebook uh, doing a bunch of stuff and and doing really on, like online reputation. Like it got to the point where in 2008, uh, I was in a group called Ladies Who Launch and we all got brought into Yelp because one of the top people at Yelp was friends with one of the girls. and. So we all created our little short codes, adrian.yelp.com and referred everybody and we were touting everybody, you know, and, da, 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 and then one day they just freaking pff, deleted a ton of people and called us all spammers. Now, I take my reputation seriously, so I fought back and I launched yelp-sucks.com and yelplawsuit.com. <laughs> and I had, you know, several thousand subscribers, I want to say five or six thousand people signed up. Uh, for the class action lawsuit and on the media list. And I still have that media list. The, the site is still there. It's still a thorn in their arm. Uh, I have a little tracker that tells me who comes to my website. And they go to my website, 10 different locations every single day. Yelp wow. offices around the country. Um, and so I did a lot of small business stuff. I did a lot of consulting. And that was really my business was really business optimization, monetization. I d used to do a thing called monetizing your passion. Back in the the crash, I did um, the curing unemployment tour. So that's why Tony Robbins was following me when he only followed 200 people was because I did a whole four day tour that was free. That was literally to inspire entrepreneurship as an alternative to joblessness. So mm. I'm all about leveraging technology to solve problems. Right. And this whole work at home thing, you know, everybody's in lockdown. They're having to homeschool their kids and they're working at home. I'm like, that's been my life for 20 years. So early COVID, I did a thing called How to Homeschool Without Day Drinking. It was, <laughs> it was quite popular. In 2009, um, I did a consultation and uh, he said, would you take Bitcoin? And I said, I don't know what that is. But I like to be bleeding edge, right? I like, like, it's an hour of my time. What do I care? Yes, show me something new. Uh, and I blew it. So I only wrote down one set of numbers. I don't have the computer anymore. <laughs> oh no. So there's 2,500 Bitcoin gone. So that sucked. Um, and, and I really kind of forgot about it at that point. So I was working on a television show. I'm an award-winning film producer uh, and I was working on another television show. And then I worked on um, a crowdfunding platform for reality TV and talk shows. And then I launched a, a talk show, but 2012 really, I, I got back into blockchain for one reason, and this is what I think people don't understand. They always look at crypto and they think, you know, get rich quick, overnight money, da 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 da, da. That isn't how I look at it at all, right? I look at it as an unfuck with liberal ledger of what actually happened and what could that solve, right? And so in mm -hmm. 2015, I was doing the television stuff, but at the same time I was working with nonprofits and I came up with this, this idea, this crazy idea. Um, turns out I wasn't the first one to have it. Jason Brink wrote a white paper on it and won an award from Microsoft in 2014 that's very, very similar. I'd never read it. But my idea was, you know, what if we could take the bricks in front of a hospital? You know, they do fundraising and they're always they're like, here, you have a brick in front of the hospital or at Walt Disney World or whatever. So fundraising, right? And, and that's kind of like creating a brick and mortar endowment, right? 
It's it's like you're there permanently. And I said, well, what if I could create a WordPress plugin or, you know, a digital wall, maybe not WordPress, but just a, a way that people could actually add this to their websites where the person who actually funded that token and minted that token, like an ICO, right? They minted the token. They are forever emblazoned on that token as it recirculates and it's non-fungible. You can't divide it. Now at the time I was dealing with Bitcoin, not programmable, very difficult. It was going to cost a million dollars. Now it would be very simple. So I think we are going to actually go ahead and do it. But basically the token has the person who endowed it and made it happen and made it come to life. And then every time it recirculates, the person who don donated to that nonprofit. So that nonprofit would have a wall and it has the legacy wall and the donor wall. But the key piece is because it's on blockchain, because it's non-fungible, because these things circulate and they travel all over the world, you'd be able to see as the person who made that token happen in the first place, that your dollar donation equals $77 in value for nonprofits every year. Like, mm. wouldn't that make you want to donate more? 100%. Right? And they don't have to pay for the bricks because it's just digital. They could literally put it on lights and have it projected on a wall and boom. Like, there's so many different ways to make it less money and easier to raise money and easier totally. to, you know, keep all of the money that you raise and not have to spend it on overhead and deliverables. Well, and, so, and just on that alone, like think of think of the fundraisers that you could project, as you're saying, you could, that's yeah. if it's an ever-changing organism in that sense, you could have the wall, you know, at galas and, and bring exactly. that, Exactly. you know, that's, that's really cool. And you could literally, so you play on the ego of the wall, the whole wall, the whole donor thing, it's all very ego driven. So you get the right people, right? And you may not be able to pay $25 million in an endowment to get your name on the side of a building at, in a hospital. Um, but you can jockey for position to get, you know, on the top of the legacy wall. Sure. And if you're doing it at a live event and you're using Chainlink to update the data, oh yeah. So Chainlink wasn't around back then, but that was part of it was, you know, like also how to raise money for sports teams, right? My friend's daughter played volleyball and she had to buy two pairs, three pairs of shoes every year and they're 350 bucks a piece. And that's not even including if she was to go on the pro circuit, um, the, the not pro pro, but you know, like the, the more professional youth league. Uh, and they go on tour and that's like $8,000. Well, a lot of really talented kids don't have that kind of money, right? Mm. So they're selling chocolate bars or newspaper magazine subscriptions or like nuts or popcorn. I'm like, how about we sell their sports cards? Because their sports cards, they have to pay almost like senior portrait money every year and sometimes multiple times a year if they're on multiple teams. What if we took that, turn them into NFTs, and then use Chainlink to have their aggregated lifetime data on the back. And, and then imagine you had Dominique Dawes' sixth grade gymnastics card and she just won the Olympics. Yeah. That'd be valuable. So you're investing Absolutely. in that athlete and you're investing, you know, and you're collecting something that could have future value. So so these are the kinds of things that I, that I think about and that I come up with. Um, I'm always looking at ways to solve problems. Like we're gonna NFT the movie that I did in 1998, I produced Metal which won awards around the world for two years. And it is a dark, depressing art film about a black man who can't get a job. And at the time, and we shot it in Hunters Point, San Francisco, uh, at the time, people weren't ready to have that kind of conversation, right? Like you think of urban poor, you think of, you know, some gangbangers walking around with guns and this and that. And it's just the actual plight of the urban poor was not up for discussion. Mm. What was interesting is, we played at a lot of black film festivals and we won, but many of the, the black viewers are like, and like we weren't, right. We weren't opening their eyes to anything. Okay. Right. The amazing transformational part is like we played in Chicago um, and I'm blanking on the name, but they did the, it was the two guys who did the movie reviews back in the eighties. And it was the film festival that they did in Chicago. And, um, the entire audience were middle to middle upper class white people. And the transformation during the Q&A was just, I could hear like how pivotal this was for them to have a glimpse into something that they never even knew existed. So for me, film and entertainment have always been very, very powerful. And we're gonna re-release pieces of that uh, as NFTs. 
Mm. And we're going to do a whole NFT campaign uh, to raise money specifically for Hunter's Point and scholarship funds for Hunter's Point kids. Oh, neat. So it's using using both the, I mean, that's a, that's a unique intersection in that you're using the art and mm-hmm. the technology to put forth something positive, you know, to give back. Oh, yeah. And at the time when I did that film, 21st Century Pictures Group, which is my film production company, I, I had it designed almost like a DAO, which I didn't know what a DAO was then. Uh, but the idea was in the the heyday of the studio system in the golden era, you could literally get hired on, uh, you know, just as a PA or whatever, and you could work your way up in the studio system, right? You, you can't really do that. The unions aren't designed exactly like that because if you have a spot, you have a spot, there's only so many spots. Like, so the way I worked it is you work your way up and once you've done five films and you're now, if you're qualified, you now ha- are the next DP or you're the next, mm. you know, camera operator or you're the next whatever, right? And especially for those positions that you really don't have to have a particular name associated with it above the line in order to get financing. So why wouldn't I give people opportunity? And we always had at least 50% female crew, at least, usually mm. 80. Before before it was the thing. norm and trendy to, to do so, yeah. Well, what's interesting is, you know, I mean, my DP was a, was a dude. My sound guy was a dude. The only reason is because I could not find a female with their own equipment of similar skill. Mm. I couldn't even find a female with their own equipment. Um, so... You know, that was really the, that was the budgetary requirement. But, you know, if they're similarly situated and they're both talented, I'm going to always pick the female because the male has a hundred times more opportunity to get hired. Do you think, do you think that with the decentralized way in which potential projects are going and, or, or revisiting former projects and releasing them as NFTs, do you think that opens up? more opportunity in a more equal way or are people obviously i'm not trying to equate film roles like we were talking about like you know your sound guy and your yeah. uh things that i'm not trying to put manual labor in the same and in, in creative manual labor in the same bucket as something tech based i have a great but answer for this i think you know where it's going so all right, all right. i do know where it's going <laughs> So yeah, then, 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 then by all means, jump it. <laughs> okay. So, so here's the deal. Um, 2017, I co-founded Crypto Vixens to inspire women to join founding teams as advisors or co-founders, regardless of technical expertise. And the reason is because I was trying to recruit this woman with 30 years healthcare experience, senior vice president onto this new blockchain company, healthcare company, health tech, right? And she just kept saying, I don't understand blockchain. I'm not really, I don't get technology. And I'm thinking, it's a healthcare company. It's a healthcare company. She kept thinking it's blockchain. The overarching impression she was getting was it's blockchain. I'm like, no, it's a healthcare company. And finally, I just got exasperated. And I'm like, girl, you use email every day. You don't know how it works. So just stop. (laughs) People have to understand that, trust me when I tell you, you do not know how everything on your phone works. You don't know where the data packets go. You don't know the secure socket layers. You don't You don't know what ports they're going through. Like you don't know. So don't let blockchain scare you because they're te- the technology people know how to do that. Let them do their job. That's not your job. You're not being asked to program. You're not being asked to do any of that. You're being asked for your industry expertise on a particular topic to solve a particular problem in an industry vertical in which you happen to be an expert. Hmm. So what was interesting, you know, back in the heyday of ICOs and back in the day when, you know, there was Lambos and strip clubs and, you know, booth babes, which don't get me wrong, they're still there. But it's really interesting to me um, because I would go to conferences and at one point I counted, there was 15 of us. And, you know, this one guy that I was sitting with, he's a very, very, very prominent lawyer. He would literally not look at the crowd. Like he looked at their feet, looked at their shoes because he didn't want to be, he didn't want to be accused of, you know, the whole me too thing. Right. 
And I just thought that was interesting because we'd be sitting there and he'd be literally like when you're people watching, he was shoe watching. Well, maybe that was for safe. a new pair he was for, safe. For, to gift, you know? He was safe to look at the shoes. <laughs> and I noticed his head would come up. I'm like, oh, Louboutins. You have a thing for Louboutins. I was wearing them <laughs> at the time. Um, anyway, so, so crypto, there's very few women. And I think the reason is, you know, it's, it's a lot of vaporware and it's a lot of get rich quick. And it's a lot of a few people are going to make money doing this really cool, interesting thing, right? And projects do you think, do you that think, women... Do you think, real quick, do you think that's the perception people have of it? Or is that the the way of the land? The, that the... was the way of the land. I think we're gotcha. shifting because we are we are definitely getting more diversity. But But back then, it was, you know, every project... I'm looking at the white paper, things are selling out. And I'm like, I'm reading the white paper and I'm going, okay, first of all, this technology doesn't exist. These three pieces of technology that they say they've got this proprietary, you know, patent pending. I'm like, those are all three open source that you kind of stitch together. Open source stitched together does not mean patentable. So just because you filed a provisional patent doesn't mean you're going to get a patent. So you're definitely not. I spent three years doing due diligence and compliance training for hedge funds and family offices. I am the freaking queen. Um, there's about five of us that are the most fraudulently added advisors to projects. Andreas Antonopoulos is the number one. And so I would go in and they'd have a stack of a hundred projects that they were interested in. And I could just psh, toss, they're like, why are you tossing those out? I'm like, cause I've never heard of it and I'm an advisor. So they're clearly lying about that. They're lying about everything else. Boom, out. Right. Like I'm just, I'm a, I'm known as the bitch who says no <laughs> and the Simon Cowell of pitch competitions. And and it's frustrating for some people, but it's also, I'm very protective of my clients, right? Because they've never lost money. Now, I say no a lot, but I do say yes sometimes. But it's a very, very thorough proctology exam on the entire project, right? You know, when they're doing something, they're like, we're going to do this and it's going to be quantum proof and da 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 And they're only raising a certain amount of money. And I go, first of all, if it's not 50 million, it's not going to be quantum proof. That's not, we're not there yet. This was like five years ago. I'm like, there's no way. It's not, that's not, mm. So the feasibility of things, then the tokenomics, this is the other thing that people have to look at, right? 99% of the time, the tokenomics are designed to incentivize early adoption and then screw the people down the way. So that's Ponzi-nomics. Look at sure. every single, this one group, oh my God. And my girlfriend got into it and I was like, girl, she goes, yeah, but I got in early. And I'm like, oh my God, you knew it was a Ponzi and you did it anyway. <laughs> okay. And that, that is not to say that I have not done a Ponzi. I did way back when um, I got roped into this and it was a hundred bucks. It was 0 .1, 0 0.1 Bitcoin. Bitcoin was a thousand. I said, okay, here's the deal. And I took it to all my internet marketers and I said, listen, this is a pyramid Ponzi scheme. It's early. It's going to cost you a hundred dollars. And here's why you're going to do it, because you would pay $395 for an internet marketing product that I could whip up right now. And you would pay me for it to learn how this stuff works and to actually practice it and do it and like figure this stuff out because you don't know anything. So they did it. <laughs> and this one guy lost his wallet, got access to it years later, and he had like two Bitcoin. He's like, oh my God. And this was when it was at the high. He had two sure. Bitcoin from point one. A cool, right. a cool, so, uh, yeah, hundred K just. Right. Yeah. Just a cool hundred K. So my thing is, you know, full transparency, full disclosure. It was a learning experience. Right. Um, but like this new one, what's interesting is the new one will pay you 3.8% compounding daily. Okay. First of all, no, you won't. Uh, do I know that that is possible? Yes. And they're not telling anybody how they're doing it. And they are certainly not doing an MLM on it. It is a very, very high-end boutique fund that crushes it. <laughs> They're not sharing the secret sauce. They're not sharing it with the public. They're not nothing. They are quietly over there raking it in. So, so yes, it's possible, but no, not like this. And so they have this, this big token pool, and then they just give everybody their rewards, 3.6, 3.6. But Obviously, it's not a circular economy, so it's going to it's gonna erode. It's going to run out at, at some point, usually about two years. This one particular company launched it. Their first one lasted about two years. Their next one lasted about a year and a half or three quarters of a year, give or take. 
The third one that my girlfriend got in on was only a month old and it was already collapsing. I'm like, I think it was because in the second one, they were indicted because they stole seven billion dollars from their holders. I'm pretty sure that has something to do with it because they're kind of named similarly. So maybe Google is presenting the old info with the new info and people are catching a clue. So you got to look at how does the token flow and what does it do? If it isn't an actual business with a real business model, with real revenue streams, with real utility, with something that is really going to generate not only, you know, viral users, people who are going to want to use it, but uh, like actually make an income, then how are they paying you those rewards? They're going to run out. So right. these are a lot of, this is, this is my day-to-day life. <laughs> well, and, 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 is, and, I, I, archi- I architect structures that actually don't fail and that and, don't have exploits and that do have really amazing consumer virality. Awesome. And <laughs> as an NFT architect, I guess maybe dive into a little bit more of what that day-to-day looks like. Because as you're describing it, you know, it's true. It's, I think a lot of people who have, that I've spoken to that are curious about the space are like, what is crypto? What is, how do I, what's Bitcoin? Uh, and it's like, well, you know, isn't it, isn't it a scam? And it's like, well, no, it's, which I think you highlighted beautifully in your explanation of what your friend, the, the kind of schemes that uh, she may have uh, encountered. It's, it's looking at what the practical use is on a very basic right. level. And if you, you can apply that to kind of any industry, you know, cryptocurrency isn't any different. If, if you're looking at a, if you're asking, what does a business do? That's, I mean, yeah. people do that all the time everywhere. So as a, as an NFT architect, what, what is that? What does that mean? What does it encompass? What, what, okay. what does your, your day-to-day look like? I will, I will give you my favorite example. So I know a lot of platinum selling Grammy winning artists. And a lot of them have huge social followings. And in this particular political climate, at any given moment, you could lose your entire following. And I would say 99% of celebrities, influencers, everyone else who utilizes social media for their platform, they don't own that platform. Uh, And then they start using these things like conversation. And I think it's called conversation. and basically it's an SMS text thread thing that, but if you read the terms of service, you don't own those people either. If you stop paying, then all of those opted in users are theirs, not yours. You can't take them with you. So the number one thing that I do is I teach them and design projects that will actually get all of their raving fans into their ecosystem, launch their creator coin on their platform, on their name.com, an IP address, a hosting plan that's not going to be deleted, so not Amazon. Um, and and I know, sorry. I just, and I'm a sensible <laughs> middle, but, you know, I am all about, I'm a constitutional scholar. I like free speech. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of the Constitution. So anyway, so so we put them into their own ecosystem. We launched their NFT project instead of using Discord, which is very dangerous to civilians, even I got suckered and I'm an OG and I got suckered. Um, it was late, I was tired, I hadn't slept in days, we were on a launch and uh, yeah, I got suckered on a fake Spooky Boy launch. So I go, oh, Spooky Boy, Spooky Boy, oh yeah, Spooky Boy, that's supposed to be good. Oh my God, and so I bought one and I'm checking my OpenSea, I'm looking, I'm like, let me see, let me see, when's it gonna show up? When's it gonna show up? And the FOMO counter's going and I'm like, oh my God, I could buy another one, I'll just buy another one. <gasps> I could buy four more. And I did. And there's no go backsies on blockchain. And I realized the gas fee was too low and the transaction took too quick for me to have minted anything. So what I actually did was just send a scammer uh, uh, money directly. Oof. So for those of you listening, here is your quick how to be prepared to deal with the FOMO counter. When you are presented with an opportunity that sounds too good to be true and there's a little timer ticking telling you that it is almost sold out, that it is almost over, that you have to make a decision right now. You have to suspend all of your logic and disbelief and just have faith and take the leap. Always, always, always have the Brave browser installed on your laptop, on your phone, everywhere. Then what you do, because I'm sure you're not 
browsing on a Brave browser all the time. You copy that link where you happen to be, you know, afflicted with that FOMO counter and you open it in Brave in a Tor browser. This is basically like they don't know you've ever been to this website. If that FOMO counter resets, it's a scam. There you go. There you, you have miss it. out on anything other than losing some money. Well, I think that's everything. <laughs> that's everything, kidding. right? Yeah, I no. mean, that's that's the, uh, the, I have a lot of little tips and tricks like that. I have a, a, a wallet security worksheet that I whipped up during the, the clubhouse heyday because we were doing 10 day crypto rooms and I did a 24 hour room. I almost made it 24 hours, three o'clock in the morning. I had to take an hour and a half nap because I was going to throw up. I was so tired, <laughs> but I did 24 hours almost. I did an extra hour and a half on the end. So the, not straight, so, but Hey, sometimes you need that, that little, the hour respite. Um, well, very interesting. So, so NFT architect, how, how did the background in, in Hollywood directly influence what you're currently doing now? So two things, um, I skipped over the part where I did Y2K Mm. uh, for Kaiser Permanente and tested all of the packages to make sure that the IV pumps wouldn't fail. And I ran the QA department working with the developers and we repackaged 626 uh, I think ish, uh, applications and deployed them to over 30 different types of computers and tested all of it. Uh, and then after that, I worked, uh, breaking into banks for a living. Nice. So penetration testing, totally legit. (laughs) I used my military security clearance. So I got to basically break into the banks on the production and the staging side. I never broke into the actual banks when they were in production just staging and development. Sorry, I misspoke earlier. Staging and development. But uh, I pulled out the entire credit card table from American Express, which is why now all of your stuff is encrypted because nobody thought about doing that. And I'm like, Licky, that was so cool. And I literally get like the little girl, like I don't have that much of a brain when I am ta- when I'm did something like really fucking badass. And I'm talking to the developers who are like the best in the freaking world. <laughs> and I'm making them cry. I try to make it funny. Well, it just never stops. This, you're, you're getting like the tip of the iceberg. Okay, wait. So, but so the architect thing. So then I was in Hollywood. Um, I, I was an advisor on music coin and music economy and, you know, several other music type blockchain royalty assurance kind of things to make things fairer for the musicians, which is how I kind of started thinking about what is it that we're doing with digital rights management? How are we? You know, how are we making things fair and trackable? Because, you know, BMI and ASCAP take six months and you only have them to believe whether or not the data is actually correct. Right. You don't really know. Right. Because it's not on the blockchain and it's not really auditable. It's it's just it's a black box. Again, I don't like black boxes. That's why I don't like Discord. Imagine some of these really viral communities. Right. People have. You know, Floyd Mayweather has 40 million fans on Instagram, right? Imagine if he had been able to actually move those people into his own community. Internet marketing law, and it is like the law of attraction. This is like the law of internet marketing. Uh, Every email address opted into your database is $1 per month. That's how much revenue you should be able to generate. Mm -hmm. Imagine how much he could generate if he actually moved them off of social media, which social media is making all of that money, not us. So you move everybody over... Um, And you just have to have a really scalable infrastructure and, you know, cloud-based. So it basically says, oops, we got a lot of, oops, spin up another one, right? Like you just have to make sure that piece is good. But if you've got less than 50,000 fans, which a lot of independent artists, that would be a tremendous amount, uh, you just use WordPress, right? You get the beefiest WordPress server you can for like 50 bucks a month and good to go. But you bring everybody over and then the Google love. See, that's the key, the Google love. When you have uh, all of these people on your website, multiple pages, going through the forums, you know, doing the chats, watching the videos, um, you know, using their NFTs to get to the token gated access stuff like the AMAs that you're doing. And if they have a rare or super rare, they could actually like be on stage with you and ask questions and all this other stuff, like all of these access things that like make them feel like they have to have it. And then doing these trading card game kind of things where if they collect all 12 songs on the album, they get a bonus unreleased 13th one, mm. right? 
So that creates this massive secondary volume. So like, that's what I architect is how do you gamify and amplify the virality as well as the, the user enjoyment and glee at even having it, let alone utilizing it on your platform? And what are the benefits? And then how do you surprise and delight continuously? And then the technology based on all of that, because I am a geek and, you know, I do code, hack, design, build, but I also speak marketing. So it helps when I'm dealing with agents and managers to say, look, this is what I'm thinking. Here's how I think we can do it. This is the budget. This is how much it's going to cost. And then here's this, 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 and this. What do you Indeed. think? And they're, they're like, as long as you run it. <laughs> yeah. They're like, you, you can take lead on this. We're going to... Uh and trust yeah. that that uh, architect uh, mindset, which to to kind of uh, just clarify. So I guess how how did you know being an award winning, winning filmmaker impact the way in which you approach being an NFT architect? I think empathy. <laughs> mm. I mean, it sounds weird, but basically, um, there's a need, right? I mean, independent artists have very few methods to get distribution. Uh, they're always, you know, especially on their first project, they're gonna take the haircut, like they're gonna take whatever deal they get. And, you know, I have these one guys, they sold their television show and the distributor put it on the shelf, wasn't even selling it, but had a 10 year deal and like just, just wouldn't give it back. It so they couldn't, they couldn't yeah. make season two. So I prefer to do everything with licenses and performance clauses rather than outright sales. So if they don't sell it and they don't make a minimum payment every year, then the rights revert back. So putting the creator more in control, having been a creator myself and I'm still a creator, I actually have a collection coming out that is uh, it's gonna be pretty baller. It's very cyberpunk. What's so funny is people look at my art and um, they're like, damn, that's dark. And I realized <laughs> cause I, I started I started doing more digital art and I was very I mean, it's I look at it now and I'm like, damn, that was pretty freshman kindergarten, like really pretty cheesy. But you look at it and and just topically. Right. I mean, it was it was all like lockdown related. And they're like, I think you're really mad. I'm like, I think <laughs> I'm really mad. And I I was really mad. I literally put it all into my art and I got it out. Better out than in, my mother always said. Well, so then it sounds like <laughs> it's both, uh, the you say empathy, it's, it's both the perspective of you as an artist and your understanding of the business side of Hollywood that sort of influences yeah. how you're navigating the web three crypto space currently nft space as well well what's interesting is see i was a producer right so that is the business side i'm sure. not a director don't ask me to do poetic cinematic moments <laughs> i was an actress i'm a very good actress um i'm a better producer uh we took my first talk show from idea that i just came up with the universe dropped it in my lap to on national broadcast television in four months. And we grew 200% week over week with no advertising, just word wow. So I know what I'm doing business-wise. So that's that's a key piece of this is how is this gonna work? How is it gonna monetize? What are the different revenue streams? I like to build in at least 15 different revenue streams just to be safe because you never know when one sector of the industry is gonna take a crapper. And then you just gotta, mm. you shift your effort and then you maybe have a little bump, but you don't, go flat, like nothing, right? Like there's things that go on in the world that, just, like I said, like with my movie, like middle-class, upper-class white people had no idea the plight of the urban poor. Like black people knew it, poor people knew it, but the people who had the power to make a change and make a difference and, you know, maybe legislate some changes, they had no idea. They just, they didn't really understand. And so these NFT projects, a lot of them are doing some really cool things. And the other piece of this as an NFT architect, I actually have a couple of clients that are not even art. They're not doing art. They're not doing music. They're not doing entertainment. Um, you know, one that I'm writing a proposal for right now, so they're not a client yet. Um, they have radio frequency dryers for grain. Grain. Corn. Wheat. Wow. Grain. Grain. 
implementing sure. an NFT project on that. Uh, Oz Living is a client and they literally, their token allows you to stake your freedom. So you buy $100,000 in tokens, you stake it, and then you get in, you get indefinite residency in the Philippines and a single member corporation in a tax-free zone of, of the free port of Bhutan that you can run your entire global business out of for wow. no taxes. From, right? so from, that's, from, that's from your NFT utility. ownership? From, well, from your token ownership, so not Got NFTs. Um, but your NFT is actually your your glasses. Like it, Everything's on the Wizard of Oz. Um, but basically your emerald glasses, that, sure. that's like your proof of proof of good, that you're a good person, that you're entitled to all of these things. So, so like like I said, an NFT can be anything. Like I said, I, I designed them originally to replace bricks in front of a hospital. Uh, it doesn't have to be art. It doesn't have to be music. It doesn't have to be uh, a meme. It doesn't have to be doge. It doesn't have to be anything. It can be whatever you can think of that would benefit from having an immutable ledger. I, I find it interesting from a, con a contractual standpoint too, how yeah. uh, you know how how this will continue to how how blockchain can continue to shift that landscape and and kind of bring light to as what you were saying predominantly uh, you know deals that weren't as transparent as perhaps they could be with they could be well you know, like like our film I have every single piece of paper. I have every contract, every location release, every receipt. I mean, I have everything from 1998. I'm not a pack rep, I promise. You're organized. Only about business stuff. But I have everything. Now, I can't find more than half the people. I'm still friends with, you know, seven of them. But the people that we can't find, the royalties literally just go into a trust account. Mm. You know, a trust, a trust, a gnosis wallet. Uh, multi sig, and it, they just they just go, and you know eventually we'll find them, <laughs> uh, you know, and a portion of all royalties go to a fund, and the people who worked on the movie get to decide how we support the community that helped us make this movie. Just want to underscore from everything you're saying is is there is a really unique opportunity, not that there hasn't been in traditional formats, but. There's really unique opportunity to have art give back through these uh, decentralized platforms and decentralized concepts, NFTs, tokenomics uh, being two of them. Um, so, so really, really awesome stuff. But um, you can all you can also reinvigorate your your catalog, right? If you have like my film is from 1998, it's never made any money. It's about to make money. Right? right? That's a past yeah. catalog, right? So every independent artist, every independent filmmaker, everyone who's ever done anything creative um, can ideate a way to turn it into an NFT launch that creates a community and does something fabulous. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. Another episode of Lights, Camera, Crypto. Adrian Ashley, thank you so much. Thank you. I've enjoyed myself. Likewise. <laughs>Thanks for listening to another episode of Lights, Camera, Crypto, a podcast produced by Matt Solon and Decentral Media. Music by Brian Duncan and Kareem Himes.